Before we get started, though, nothing in this video is financial advice. I am not a financial advisor. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money, your responsibility. And one more housekeeping duty, guys. Please subscribe to the channel. We're about to hit that 1,000 subscriber benchmark. And once we do, this channel will get monetized, which means it'll make it a lot more sustainable for me to provide you with content and more guests that we're seeing lately, more high profile guests. So if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. It's only a click, it doesn't cost you a single dime. So if you could do that for me, I'd really appreciate it. And if you enjoy this video, be sure to give it a like as well and comment down below. What, uh, what markets do you, you know, are you, or sectors are you seeing, um, you know, are you, are you kind of long in what, what, what do you see the most value in? Um, what's, what's cheap in your mind at the moment, if there is anything cheap. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, it, it, the things to, that I, that right now I would stay away from are the things that are showing, um, bubble dynamics. And it's kind of surprising that we're seeing another little bubble form because it's it, it's riding the wave of the leftover free money but ai is just dis, is displaying a lot of bubble dynamics a lot of the same uh indicators that um the nfts and crypto um and work from home and you know there, there there were these waves since 2020 started of hey going from one bubble one bubble to the right. next and ai is displaying that right now i think it may very last one of these, you know, bubbles to form and then pop, um, writing, writing that 2020 wave of money printing. Um, and the, re the reason why I say it's a bubble is not because that it's not going to be revolutionary or change things or money making to whoever lasts, but there's no moat and there's no, um, there, there's, there's, there's just, there's no moat. And so the competitive playing field for this drives, drives everything to zero very fast. So you have the initial players that all get wiped out from, from competition and somebody will win. Um, there will be winners from it, but it's, it's almost impossible to predict. And the, um, the other indicator of these bubbles is just looking at valuations. Like NVIDIA's val it's, they've got like a, uh, like a 200, uh, price to earnings ratio right now, which means that if they took all their profits and they paid all their profits, hundred percent of the profits in a dividend to their shareholders, um, it would take 200 years before you got back your investment in the stock. <laughs> so um, th those are uh, those are unrealistic valuations. Um, now, uh, the areas that that uh, that I see that are on sale right now, there, there. Let me put it this way: there are more and more areas that are starting to become uh, attractive. There are not that many that I see that are attractive yet. Other than, um, I would say like commodities are looking that way. Um, and, uh, and the, 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 the stuff that people have to buy, um, are, are the areas that when times get tough tend to do really well. So this is one of the reasons why like Berkshire Hathaway has done very well over the last, I don't know, year, year and a half versus something like, you know, that, you know, Amazon or uh, some of these tech companies are down 50 to 90% from their peak versus companies, let's say like Berkshire Hathaway, they were not doing anything and now they're starting to perform well. Um, uh, defaulting to the stuff that people have to buy no matter what um, is the is the play when times get tough because people stop buying the, the luxuries, they'll stop buying enter, the entertainment stuff, they'll stop buying the uh, the fun stuff, the tech stuff, the flashy stuff, the expensive stuff, um, and they'll be forced to put all, all their money, even at higher prices from the inflation, into the things that they must keep on buying. So, you know, food, water, rent, transportation, gas, um, and then fixing things because we live in a world of entropy and so stuff breaks. And so, um, and so the stuff that, uh, that makes stuff, um, and the raw materials that go into that stuff, um, those are all things that tend to, uh, tend to do better. And they're still at this point, a lot of those areas are on sale. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Joe. Uh, where can people find you? 
Number one place is going to be YouTube, Heresy Financial. Um, number two place is going to be Twitter. My handle there is at Heresy Financial. And then um, I'm trying to get out on all the socials as well. Not as active uh, elsewhere, um, but uh, but you can find me on most of the other social media platforms as well. Awesome. Um, any other closing comments before we head out? Just uh, um, I, I think the most important thing that anybody can anybody can do is number one, de-risk. So you know, get if you've got credit card card debt stat just came out today. The average person now has $10,000 in credit card debt and the average credit card interest rate is like 24% now. Um, and so that's, that's going to kill your ability to survive. So get out of the dangerous debt, de-risk, um, and then start building a, a safety net. So start building up those reserves and learning, study, get, get financially literate, learn how to, you know, read financial statements and, uh, see if a company is, uh, uh, at a good price or not. And, um, and then you'll be able to take advantage of the deals as they start coming soon here. Yeah. Best thing you can invest in, I always say is just yourself because they can't tax that. I mean, you know, you can, you, you can, you can get taxed on capital gains. You can get taxed in every other facet in life, but when it comes to the knowledge that you've accrued, knowledge and experience that you accrue as an individual, um, that stays with you forever. If you look at like the equities, over the last two, three years and versus the actual commodities. It could be anything. It could be uranium. It could be the precious, uh, maybe not the precious metals, but it could be, um, you know, not gas, oils, whatever. Uh, the equities have largely outperformed the the commodities themselves. Do you think that'll continue to be the case or will we see a switching where the commodities begin to outperform the, the equities just because of stuff like uh, margins being squeezed due to higher input costs and that kind of thing? I think the equities will continue to outperform, but yeah, it'll be, you'll have a lot of disasters along the way. Like you have a lot of, yeah, it's, it, it's always a sort of debate I have with it and say something like oil where you can choose between going into like um, producers or even explorers. You can just go for the straight clean play on something like a WTI futures option, which is, it's quite appealing at times because it's um you cut out all the operation and jurisdictional risk. Like, there's literally nothing worse in this in this game than being spot on with where you think the underlying commodity is going to go and then losing your shirt because it was a, a some some sort of a yeah they got the mine taken off them or they they just did something dumb operationally or they just dilute you to um, high heaven and so I uh, the the equities will definitely outperform. But again, there'll be a lot of horror stories of people putting all their eggs in a, in a basket and it not working out. So I think um, yeah, for the standard investor, like with uranium, it's probably smarter just to buy the physical and just be happy with um, physical overshooting at some point because you've taken so little risk. Whereas with most of the equities, you're just, you're taking on, you're getting diluted. Like the the cost inflation is pretty crazy across this. Um, like I think even... Xanaprom and Paladin are running like 30, 40% cost inflation. So those guys have already um, already having mines can imagine what developers are going to get hit with when they're trying to bring mines um, online in the years to come. So um, just more dilution, all the um, yeah, all the sort of mine plans is going to be, yeah, if, if they're a few years old, you, they probably have to <laughs> sharpen their pencil when they come back to the board to redo them, especially if like oil's um, we're going where I think it is if it's sort of um, well north of a hundred bucks and of course that's going to feed into all the stuff. It's a, I think it's a point I've touched on quite a few times. It's like everyone asks why aren't and um, and more of like the battery metals, like why aren't I playing copper or something? Can I just see you, you separate commodities between like OPEX commodities and more CAPEX commodities. And if um, the OPEX commodities are sort of operational, mainly oil, coal to an extent for a lot of industrial processes, but um, they're going to flow into the others. And so you're going to, a lot of this price spike is going to take off first will be energy and it will flow into copper and copper will take off. But I think you'll, um, you'll get far more of uh, far more volatility being in the energy space and far, far more upside in my view. Yeah. And especially versus precious metals. I, I kind of see the energy outperforming precious metals by a wide margin over the next decade. Yeah, I think it'll be similar to the, you can bring up charts from the 
to the seventies and eighties and bring it right forward to today. And even though oil was quite expensive and gold was quite cheap, um, oil still outperformed gold by at least ten percent a year for um, over that period. Isn't isn't there like yeah yeah isn't there like an order of operations with like capital rotation like in commodity super cycles where you initially see the energy stocks rise and then you see you know the, the metals rise and then the precious metals come mm -hmm. last is, isn't that yeah. how it goes yeah i haven't seen um i haven't seen like that displayed in the chart but yeah it kind of makes sense um when you say it like that yeah I haven't, I haven't seen any research on it or anything, but no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about nat gas? Are you, uh, are you playing with that at all? You know where it's at? No. So I, I play, I, I did originally when it was just super cheap, cheap out of kind of COVID, but um, I think I was um, in Ontario um, resources, played that for a while, but now I, I just view coal as kind of a proxy for gas. So um with with gas, you've got um, it's actually really hard to kind of play LNG and play like you can see what um, TTF and um, and I'm forgetting what the Asian one is. J, this JMI, the um, you see what the sort of the gas the exchanges do there, but gas is traded with like far higher multiples, and everyone kind of gets the argument far more. It's just not as hated as coal. You get you get a um, Get a far better valuation of coal, and you, I feel like you get a lot of the sort of the upside with a lot more, with far larger margin of safety with coal. So I've kind of played it that way, and they they both go hand in hand. So yeah, my main players are still the likes of like Peabody and Whitehaven is how I kind of um, kind of try and capture natural gas, and it's also yeah far more volatile, which is. Um, not that coal hasn't been volatile now. As I'm saying this, it's it's drawn down just as much. Yeah. Um, so what about like outside the commodity space? Do you see anything that meets your criteria of, you know, distressed sector and hated? Do you, is there anything outside the commodity space that you're currently in as well? Um, oh, I'm in a lot of stuff that's not like just like a kind of a service related to commodities. So mm -hmm. like the, I don't know if that's what you're asking, kind of like the, offshore service vehicles like the servicing the rigs and then the rigs are obviously um oil services um also product tankers i uh, own a decent whack of them so like shifting fuel around so like so um overall no i've got i've got no exposure outside of sort of commodity derivatives yeah um, the, the closest I come is I like a lot of the yeah like the frontier markets. Like as I said, if I get a big exit, I'll be um, out of some of these stocks. I'll be looking to put money to work in some frontier markets, um, like Africa, like Uzbekistan. Um, I really like that idea of going into kind of situations where there's just been a currency devaluation. I'm thinking Michael. He he went to Sri Lanka just after um, the big devaluation. Um, the sort of the big crisis there and was picking up a few assets um, at that time that he'd had his eye on. That that really appeals to me. Um, like further down the track, maybe more property. But um, yeah, for now, no, I'm pretty much... Hey, sorry. Is that line, is that line speed okay? Uh, yeah. I, I think I, I think it was from my end though. So my apologies. Okay. Yeah, I think it was my internet. But That's all right. Favorite. So the last thing I heard was that uh, you weren't in um, nothing outside of the service um, no. sectors. Yeah. No. Okay. Got it. Cool. Um. So how long do you think this uh this super cycle this commodity super cycle is going to last? How how much uh you know, does it still have a lot of legs left? left in it yeah i think it'll be the better part of a decade i think okay. this, this stuff doesn't resolve quickly the um it was jeff curry put it best it was like it'll be three years before institutional money will join in because they don't pick inflections they want to see a clear trend in place then once they start investing it'll take three years for the um 
the sector to start to absorb that capital. And then with that capital in play, it'll need at least six years before all like, the supply kind of comes online. Kind of <laughs> inherently kind of makes sense is, um, yeah, yeah, we're got a long runway. And especially if you're in stuff that's just going back to um, things that are hard to replicate, like hard to replace, like just a, mm. just a, we're a bad drill ship. The, the shipyards are still full of, um, Building, whether it be LNG tankers, whether it be um, some of the more bulk carriers, um, there's no sort of space for a number of years. And then even if they can then get space, then it's going to take another few years to to build build the the um, the rigs. And so you've just got this this window of like minimum sort of five years before they could even start to come online. And so I just want to kind of keep replicating that trade where I get the biggest moat and you can see the the sort of highest level of kind of excess earnings being maintained for as long as possible. And yeah, the same can be said for obviously mines that you can get cheap. Like the the one that always comes to mind is Peabody with having gone through a bankruptcy and written off a whole heap of debt. Um, you've got all their their mines now sort of being held on the books for cents on the dollar really with all that debt gone. So a whole lot of stuff like that will just be I see them being cash cows moving forward and um, yeah, looking forward to the next few years. Got it. What, what about CapEx? Are you seeing CapEx start to pick up anywhere in any any of these sectors or no? Not really. Like you're still seeing it at all times low, like cash flows there, but the sort of reinvestment, I've got some good charts on coal CapEx is still, uh, still like just crawling along the bottom. Like obviously no one believes um, that there's any need for coal moving forward. So the um, investment's just not there. Oil, I think it's um, oil reinvestment still at a multi, multi-decade low, I believe. And even though cash flows jumped out, so it's just all shareholders are on the back of being burned so badly and shale are just demanding sort of um, demanding capital be returned to them, whether it buybacks or dividends. And so it's um, still kind of just making this whole um issue worse yeah there's so i think we've definitely seen the bottom and the lows and like just lack of investment it is starting to pick up but it's still pretty anemic yeah it's no nowhere where it needs to be and it's also interesting when you think about it that every year that goes by you need to spend more with higher cost inflation and also just then like just straight inflation like it's um yeah like with the the dollar getting <laughs> like debased it quite a rate like if you kind of earmark this is what should have been spent and um so sort of this many hundred billion should have been spent over this period of years well that hundred billion isn't worth what this hundred billion is in the next five years like if you've had um sort of high single digit inflation for a few years that's <laughs> you gotta you gotta add a few more um yeah. a bit more money to get that same sort of real purchasing power mm. unskilled minimum wage laborer in 1965 was paid more than a senior engineer in 2012 yeah measure the wage in gold yep in terms of purchasing power no in, ter- in terms of gold yeah now, no, the, yeah, in terms of gold yeah the thing, the thing with purchasing power is that every industry is constantly working to improve efficiency mm-hmm. so what I, argue, what I argue in that piece is essentially that the currency is falling wages are falling and real prices are falling. And because the currency is falling, people are totally confused because the currency is how they try to measure everything else. Yeah. They, try to, yeah. they try to adjust the currency using consumer prices, which are falling, and consumer prices are measured in the currency. So you have the self-referential thing. So I say, suppose you had a brick, a big, heavy brick, and you strap a GoPro to it, and you throw the brick over the edge. And then you throw right after that, you have a piece of two by four and you throw that over the edge of the cliff as well. From the vantage point of the go of the GoPro camera, the two by four appears to be rising. Yeah. And it's a, it's a function of your vantage point is wrong. So wages are falling, but consumer prices are falling too, but nobody sees it because the currency is falling faster than both perhaps. So nominal wages are obviously much, much, much higher. I mean, a wage in 1965 was $2,000 a year or something like that. And today, wages are a lot higher than that. Um, but obviously, consumer prices are higher. 
But if consumer, so only, the only thing people care about, if consumer prices are are are, are one kind of wood and wages are a different kind of wood and the currency is the brick, they only care about the difference in the fall rate of this kind of wood versus this kind of wood. They only care that, okay, my wage can buy slightly more milk than it could have in 1965. And what they've missed is that their labor is producing 10x more milk and they're getting 1%, so 10 times, 1,000% more milk being produced with the same labor. But the guy who's working in that milk production can buy 1% more milk than he used to. And so you know, what's happened is the bid ask spread on labor has widened. But you have to produce infinitely more to get slightly more consumption power. And where's the difference going? Well, it's feeding the maw of the welfare state and the regulatory state. That's what the difference is. And so it isn't even primarily, what I'm talking about here, isn't even at root a monetary problem, but the monetary problem masks the real problem, which is we now have, somebody was telling me, I don't know if this is true, 30 million government employees, that's got to cost a pretty penny. Now, most of those government employees, I guess half of, I mean, I don't know what the breakdown of welfare versus regulator is. Let's assume half of them are doling out free monies to encourage people not to be productive. And the other half are actually attacking productive businesses and reducing their productivity and forcing the businesses to hire more non-revenue producing employees to defend themselves against the regulators. This is an enormously expensive system. And all of this productive, you know, that, that one guy working in the milk industry producing 10x what he used to produce in 1965, but only getting 1% more milk for it, or what I, I had the statistic in the article. It's been whatever, 11 years since I wrote it. Um, the difference between a thousand percent and one percent, the difference isn't going to align corporate greed. No, it's going to feed the wel welfare and regulatory state. That's the that's the thing, and nobody sees that. They only care about the difference between my wage went up by this, prices went up by this. I can buy more with my wage. I can buy less with my wage. And generally, you can buy more. Right? In 1965, um, there was not an obesity issue probably for several reasons, but one of which is food was a hell of a lot more expensive than it is now. Clothing was a hell of a lot more expensive than it was, you know, it is now. We won't even talk about electronics. Almost Electronics is almost an unfair comparison. But just looking at food, food and clothing, to name two, uh, got a hell of a lot cheaper. Yeah. Uh, but because, not, because the rate of, rate of increase in productivity has gone faster than the rate of debasement of the money or even the advance of the regulators. Yeah. What, what about if you control for like quality standards? Like uh, like the food that we consume today is a lot more. Uh, there's a lot of corners that are cut uh, when it comes to the food, the clothes, all that stuff compared to. I think, uh, I mean, I get the argument. There's a lot of people eating a lot of junky food. Yeah. And there's no denying that. I mean, that's true. Um, I mean, we have homeless. We, I mean, we have you know obese homeless people in this country. But I was going to say yeah. today, yeah. impoverished means obesity. Never yeah. in human history was that true. Obviously, we're producing a hell of a lot more food. Quality, okay, yeah, you shouldn't be eating deep fried um, modified cornstarch. That's not good. So if, you, if your diet consists of cheese doodles and Fritos and all that crap, yeah, it's really bad. Um, but, you know, just speaking of my own life, now obviously I've done pretty well in business. Um, I, you know, I, I don't eat, I mean, I'll have a few potato chips now and then, I suppose, like the next guy, but... My diet isn't largely that kind of junk. I eat real food that's prepared, you know, the old fashioned way. Yeah. And it's cheap enough that I can do that. You know, I I mean, I, I generally don't don't cook. I don't, I'm, I'm so busy working that I just go out to eat in restaurants when I do. Um, and that's quite affordable. And there's a zillion and one restaurants and you can get real chicken and real beef and real green beans and real whatever's. It was a hell of a lot more expensive back then. I remember as a kid, you know, snickering that there was some family that um, they didn't save their leftovers. And, you know, we all kind of chuckled at that because that, that seemed almost outrageous. And today, you know, whether you keep your leftovers or not, it's more of a, a matter of planning lunch for tomorrow than the financial necessity to do so. Okay, I'm in a better position than maybe a lot of people. People may be snickering at me for saying that, you 1% or whatever, but there's no question food's gotten a lot cheaper. Even good quality food has gotten a hell of a lot cheaper. Clothing, I wrote an article and I, I know I've made people angry by saying this. I bought a pair of Levi's 501 jeans. And I remember in 1983, I was in high school 
And that represented a lot of money to me. I think I saved up for quite a while to get that. It was $50 that stuck in my head. It's one of those, you know, relatively first purchases with my own money kind of thing. Um, I was 15, I think, when I bought them. And I wrote an article, now this is pre-COVID and everything's gotten messed up since then. Um, but I found uh, on, uh, on, a, on a Google search, you could buy a pair of Levi's 501s for $37.50. And, you know, a lot of angry people said, but the quality of the Levi's is lower today. Well, I don't generally wear Levi's, but I do have a pair of Levi's that were bought recently. I'm not noticing a difference in the quality. Maybe there's some difference. Mm. But if the world worked in, in the way that the uh, massive inflationists argue, that the money supply has gone up by whatever multiple since then, then prices should be, you know, 10x or 100x higher. There'd be no way that you could reduce the quality such that prices are actually lower. I remember the 1970s, every item in the grocery store was up every week. And mm -hmm. I'm sure they were trying to cheapen it. I'm sure, and I, I do recall that they were shrinking. You know, sometimes you'd look underneath the bottle or the can and you'd see this hollow spot and the hollow spot would get bigger and they're playing every game you could imagine. But every price was going up every week. And here's this period of, you know, 40 years and the price is down. By by uh, you know what is it twenty five thirty percent? Yeah. Yeah. If the quality of the rivets is lower or whatever it is, that just isn't sufficient to explain why the price is down twenty five percent when the theory predicts it should be up a thousand percent. Right. Yeah. So so things are getting cheaper because manufacturing is getting more efficient. It is. Industry is much 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 more efficient now. Things are much more computerized. Automation at every stage from design to obviously cutting the fabric, sewing it. There's giant machines, I'm sure of it. And um, so people only care about the difference between, so when I, I, I take a step back and I'm gonna make a point here. When I did the um, SWOT analysis, familiar with SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. If you're starting a business, that's one of the first things you should do. And I founded something called the Gold Standard Institute to try to advocate, you said, is it possible to reach people? That was my goal with the Gold Standard Institute. So I did the SWOT analysis and one of the things that I came up with was the argument that we should have a gold standard because it fixes inflation is actually a weak argument. Um, so if you break the, the voters down into three or four constituencies, there isn't really one that cares a great deal about inflation. I mean, everyone gets together in a bar with their buddies and they nostalgize over, oh, yeah, I remember when gas was 25 cents a gallon or whatever. But it's not really a compelling uh, argument. The welfare class is all they care is does the EBT card work. The working class only cares if their wage keeps up with inflation. And if it doesn't, they don't blame the Fed. They blame their greedy bastard employer. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder class, to point the finger at with inflation. Right, the middle class cares about their assets and their 401k. And, and the 1% cares, obviously, about their assets. And comp is usually ties to asset appreciation if you're a banker or CEO or something like that. And so the idea that um, consumer prices are going up, whether it's 1% a year or even 10% a year, people don't really care that much. They care about the spread between the wage going up, which it is, or if you're retired, there's a cost of living adjustment of COLA on your pension. That's going up and consumer prices are going up. And they only care about, they're racing neck and neck. If prices get ahead, then they complain. And if the wage gets ahead, they stop complaining for a while. Meanwhile, the entire system is in free fall. So the currency is yeah. a brick. The wages are a log. Consumer prices are a different kind of wood. Everything's in free fall. And nobody notices that the, the cliff face is rushing, you know, up faster yeah, and faster. Looking down. They're, they're just obsessed with the minute differences between this wood and that wood, which one is outracing the other at that, that given moment. And um, very perverse. I don't know, what can I say? Right. Let's look at the machine learning model. So <clears throat> basically what I did here, and I outlined this in, pre in uh, last week's video, but essentially I took uh, the oil price over time. I took the DXY, the dollar strength. I took the gold price and I used those three variables as well as the passage of time to predict, to run it through a machine learning model and predict what the fair value uranium price should be. Okay. So the red line here is what the model thinks you know, this again, this is taking in data stretching all the way back to 2006. And it's tracking the gold price, it's tracking the oil price, it's tracking the dollar strength 
all relevant predictors of commodities like uranium. It's taking all those prices into account and spitting out what it thinks should be the fair value of uranium. And as you can see here over time, it pretty much does a fairly good job in tracking it. Now you notice here when the actual price here in blue gets significantly ahead of the price here in red, uh, that's a sign that the actual price, that the price of uranium is well above fair value. And what happens thereafter? It crashes all the way down. And now you see the same thing um, in reverse. So here in 2021, you saw the actual value of uranium significantly below uh, what the predicted model price should be. So the model was saying uranium was should be uh, vastly more expensive than it is in, uh, than it was here in 2021. And then look at what happened thereafter. We see a huge shot up in the uranium price to meet that. And of course, it overshoots. But uh, we have pretty much corrected back up to the, uh, as of today, we're still a little undervalued. So this blue line is still below this red line. So despite this most recent move in the uranium price, where the model is still saying that the uranium price is still slightly undervalued compared to what it should be based off the oil price, based off where the dollar is today, based off where the gold price is today. And this model is 89%. So it's got an R squared value of 89%. And basically what this means is that it's capturing 89% of the variability in this data. So that's a that's actually a pretty good number. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the model here. And uh, so this looks at the trend. This breaks down the trend. This strips out this trend with underlying the data. And as you can see here, we've had... 2020, 2021, and 2022 consecutively going up. So we've had ups and downs, but the trend has been up. It's telling us that we have we see a clear breakout of this downtrend here. So it's it's telling us that 2020 was a breakout year for uranium. Now, if we look at each individual month here, we've got January. Uh, we've got uh, each individual month, um, and it identifies which months perform the strongest and which months perform the weakest. And as, as you can tell here, March 1st to July 1st, or sorry, March to July, you typically see doldrums in the uranium price. The uranium price tends to have seasonal effects that impact it on the downside. So we're currently in June. We should ex So we should expect to see downside pressure in the uranium price. So let me break it down for you. The uranium price has been going up. The model is saying, after crunching all this data, it's saying that we're currently in an environment with, with downward pressure that should be pressing down the uranium price. Essentially, the uranium price is going, there's, there's headwinds against the uranium price. It shouldn't be going up, but it is going up despite the headwinds. So that is good news in our case. This year is an anomalous year. So there hasn't been any buying from SPUT. And we're in a seasonal time of the year where the uranium price should be going down. But it's not going down. It's going up. So what does this mean when we start getting tailwind uh, during June and beyond? You know, this, this tailwind lasts all the way up until from July all the way out until February, actually. So once we get to July, we'll have a lot more sale behind our back. And again, this corresponds to what we saw in 2021. 2021, we saw the uranium price spike around this time here in September. And it continued spiking all the way out until March of 2022, which is when we had that big crash. Not, not big crash, but uh, the beginning of the consolidation phase, okay? And then finally, uh, this chart is interesting. interesting. Okay, so let me break it down for you. So remember how we said we used oil, gold, and the DXY as predictors for the uranium price? Well, this chart tells us whether the environment induced by those three predictors, whether the oil price, the gold price, and the DXY, the combination of those three predictors, whether that was a tailwind or a headwind against, our, against uranium price. So anytime it's above this zero value, that means that 
those three predictors were actually pushing the uranium price up. Anytime it's below zero, it's a negative territory. That means that those three predictors were pushing the uranium price down. So whatever the oil price was, whatever the gold price was, that was actually a headwind against uranium. So what do we see here? So we were at this zero level up until 2021. And that's when we started seeing the rise in the uranium price. And in 2021, we had a rising oil price. We had uh, the DXY had yet to rise. So we had a positive macro, well, a positive environment pushing us to the upside. Where are we at today? Where are we at today? We're we're in pretty much neutral ter territory. We're still above zero. So the macro environment, um, when it comes to gold, oil, and DXY, is still in our favor. But nonetheless, even though the macro environment isn't as good as it was all the way out here in early 2022, we're still seeing a rise up in uranium. We're still in positive territory. The, the macro environment is still a tailwind for our uranium uh, price. So that's what we got here today, guys. Drop me a comment what you uh, what you guys think about this stuff. Do you guys want to see more machine learning techniques in, uh, applied uh, to commodities like uranium? What else would you like me to uh, kind of track as well? Drop me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Do you think this is, uh, you know, is simply a dead cat bounce? It's, uh, it's a bull trap, as they say. Or is there you know, something more to the story here. Really interested to hear what you guys say. And with that said, I will see you in the next video. And don't forget to subscribe too. Don't forget to subscribe. Get those subscri uh, subscribe numbers up. Get that 1,000 subscriber number. We will be monetized. We will create more and more content. It will make it a lot more sustainable if I can get paid to do this stuff. And we'll get more we'll get, we'll get more guests as well. So the guests will look at the channel. They'll see, oh, well, this guy's got 1,000 subscribers. I'm more like, they're more likely to, to say yes to an invitation. Um, to be a guest here. So really appreciate you guys. And with that said, until next time, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.